is our uh, second segment or second session, or second service in this series that I started on last week. And the series is entitled Doers. But before I get to what I'm going to talk about today, I want to draw it out of Matthew chapter 14 in the King James Bible. In verse 25 it says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for what? Fear. Fear. But straightway Jesus spoke unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, when he saw the storm, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, now here's the question he asked, wherefore didst thou doubt? So uh, this morning we're talking about this series I entitled called Doers. Everybody say doers. doers. This morning the subtitle, uh, what I want to talk about specifically today is Doers versus Doubters. Okay. Doers versus Doubters. Doubters. How many doubters are in here right now? No doubters are in the house. Amen. We have all doers in the building. Come on, let's bow our hearts and our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this moment in this time of ministry, and we ask you to bless your people through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone who agrees say amen. amen. Before you see this, slap high five with about five people and tell them I'm a doer this morning. Tell them I'm a doer this morning. Praise God. Amen. So let me just point out a couple of verses, and um, I'm a little under the weather, so I appreciate your prayers today. Uh, what does that mean, under the weather? Well, why do they say under the weather? <laughs> I never thought about that. Anyhow. Um, listen to this scripture. It says, Jesus is walking on the water. They see him coming. They cry out for fear. They think it's a spirit. Jesus said, no, it's me. Peter sees him. He says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come. Jesus says, come. And Peter starts walking on the water. He's walking on the water. Everybody says, Peter is walking on the water. He sees a storm. He begins to sink. Jesus reaches out, catches him. O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore is did thou doubt? So this morning I'm talking about doers versus doubters. I'm going to give you about three or four points today. I want you to write this first one down. Uh, this is important that you understand this. Uh, how, how many of you want to live successful Christian lives? Let me see your hands. I want to be a success. I mean, of course in life, but a successful Christian life. Let me see your hands. If you really want to live a successful Christian life. Okay. You're in the right place today then. Because I'm gonna, you're gonna hear some some good teaching that's gonna help you with that. Number one, write this down. You cannot be a doubter and a doer at the same time. You cannot be a doubter and a doer at the same time. You're either one or the other. You're either a doubter or you're either a doer. And I, and I must preface this by saying, uh, I need to cut Peter some slack the same way we need to cut Thomas slack because he's known as Doubting Thomas. 
In other words, just because you doubt it one time doesn't make you a doubter. <laughs> Does that make sense? But for the sake of this sermon and some of the things that I want to share with you, I want to pull what the Lord showed me in this scripture here. So you cannot be a doubter and a doer at the same time. It's almost like saying, I'm a sinner saved by grace. So you ever heard that term before? I'm just an old sinner saved by grace. Well, no, either you're a sinner or either you're saved by grace. But you can't be both at the same time. They are the antithesis or an oxymoron to one another. They are diametrically opposed to one another. You cannot be a sinner saved by grace. When you get saved, you become the righteousness of God. You are no longer in the sinner category. You're no longer in the sinner status. He takes you out of the sinner status over into the righteous status in, in your righteousnesses of God. Are y'all following what I'm saying? And I need to say this because I know some of you guys, you get caught up and, and, and you don't sometimes even understand. Sometimes you don't ask questions. And I wish I had time to really dive into this because Jesus asked him a question. Why did you doubt? And sometimes you have to ask yourself questions. Like I just say I'm under the weather. But then I think about it. Why, what does that mean? Sometimes you have to ask yourself questions. And sometimes, you know, like years ago, this old unbiblical song came out. Many of you was walking around singing it. Uh, the song, y'all know, we fall down, but we get up. Come on, don't look at me like that. You know, that was a great song, wasn't it? You were singing that song. The song was consolation to you, and it consoled you. We fall down, but we get up. That's fact. That's true. The unbiblical part was, a saint is just a sinner who fell down. You can't be a saint and a sinner at the same time. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They're diametrically opposed to one another. So my point is you can't be a doer and you can't be a doubter at the same time. Does that make sense? And this is important that you understand this because in the day that we live in, um, there is a confusing spirit being sent out into the world. In other words, there are things that have been sent out to confuse us about things that are really clear in their distinction. Hmm. In other words, we now have educated people and we now have politicians saying that, you know, uh, gender neutral restrooms are normal. They're not normal. They will never be normal because when God created us, he created us male and female. So there's a clear distinction between boys and girls. There's a clear distinction between men and women. There's a clear distinction between male and female. There's a clear distinction between sinner and saint. There's a clear distinction between doubters and doers. You can't be both at the same time. Yeah. Does this make sense? I'm, let me just break it down. Doubters are apprehensive. Just look up the definition for doubt. Doubters are apprehensive, but doers are, are confident. Doubters are uncertain, but doers are sure. Doubters are suspicious, but doers are trusting. Doubters are um, uh, pessimistic but doers are optimistic. And so you can't be both at the same time. And that's the point I wanted you to write down. You cannot be a doubter and a doer at the same time. Now let me, can I take it a step further here? There are two little words, there's two letter word, a little word on the beginning of doubt, and it's the word do. <laughs> so I just said you can't be a doubter and a doer at the same time. Right? So I want you to write this down. Many doubters, here's what I learned, start out being doers. But some storm in life caused them to turn from being a doer and becoming a doubter. Hmm. This is what happened to Peter. Peter is walking 
on the water. He's a doer. Dude was doing it. I mean, just think about that for a moment. Can you imagine what the other disciples must have been doing when they saw Peter walking on the water? Like he steps out of the boat and starts walking to Jesus. Can you imagine the faith that was present for this man to do that? And can you imagine the disciples in the boat? It's almost like, you know, when your kid, your little baby takes their first step and you, st- you said, they're doing it. Right. They're doing it. Oh, and when they ride the bicycle and they're able to balance for the first time, you're standing back, they're doing it. I'm sure that's how the disciples was with Peter. Like, dude, he's doing it. He's walking on the water. Right. Now you read that and you casually brush over it as if it's some uh, a, a mystical story in scripture that's really not true. But see, the first thing you have to make up in your mind is whether you believe the word of God or not. That's right. And Peter is walking on the water. I don't know about you, but I call that being a doer. Oh, for sure. That's huge. But then he sees the wind and the wave, the storms, and he took his eye off Jesus. See, it's not really the storms. It's us taking our eyes off Jesus in the midst of the storm. And he began to sing. I mean, I don't know. I mean, this, in other words, it's almost like, it's almost like, uh, I I wish, it's like, in life with God, things are going in slow motion. With you, things are going so fast. But with God, it's slow motion. I mean, have you ever seen anybody begin to sink? Either you sink or you don't. But with God, he is so quick to get in there on your behalf. It it was like with God, he was like, he was just, he saw him when he began to sink. I ain't never seen nothing begin to sink. You throw a rock in the water, it just, it sinks. It don't begin. It's not like, it's just, you know, when does the starting point of sinking happen? It's so fast. But God just stretched his arm out. Jesus stretched his arm out and caught him before he sunk. And then he asks, why did you doubt? That was my point. Many doubters start out being doers, but some storm in life causes them to turn from being a doer and becoming a doubter. Storms. Are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, some of you are sinking in areas you used to be walking in. Yeah, some of you are sinking in areas. Some of you, you are sinking in serving when that's an area you used to be walking in. Wow. You're sinking in tithing when that's an area you used to be walking in. Wow. You're sinking in supporting your pastors and the vision of your church when that's an area you used to be walking in. But because of some storm. Come on, pastor. You've allowed the storm to stop you from being a doer, and now you've become a doubter. And the devil, let me share something with you. The devil uses doubt to derail you to keep you from being a doer. And this is why you have to distance yourself from doubters. You understand what I'm saying? You have to distance yourself from doubters because all doubters want to do is rain on your parade. All doubters want to do is bust up your party. All doubters want to do is bust your balloon. All doubters want to do is tell you what doesn't work. All doubters want to do is tell you what you cannot do. Well, I tried that and they tried it and because the storm messed them up, now they want to tell you what you can't do. But you have to distance yourself Come on, y'all. You have to distance yourself from the doubters and you start having to declare what Philippians says, I can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens me. How many doers do we have in the room right now? Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so you have to distance yourself from doubters, people who are telling you what can't work. 
It just doesn't work. I've tried going to church and really nothing happened and nothing changed. And I tried being committed and it doesn't really work. And I tried paying my tithes for four weeks straight and I really didn't see a turnaround. And I tried praising the Lord and I tried being nice and I try and it don't work but you ought to look at your neighbor and tell him you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him I've been walking with the Lord long enough to know come on are y'all hearing what I'm saying and you have to learn how to distance yourself from the doubters and start declaring what God is doing in your life amen and so I've seen it before. There's a scripture that says, you started running the race well, but there's that question. See, Jesus asked him, wherefore, why did you doubt? Where, where, why did you doubt? Well, the answer is in the scripture. See, see, the answer is in the scripture. Doubt is... Listen to this. Doubt is the uncle of uncertainty. Doubt is the aunt of apprehensiveness. Doubt is, at the end of the day, doubt is the fruit of fear. Right when they came out and saw Jesus, they said, it's a spirit, and they was what? Afraid. Jesus had to deal with their fear right out of the gate and said, it is I, be not afraid. Peter says, cool, I got it. He's walking on the water, then he sees the storm, then the scripture says he gets afraid again. Fear. In other words, why did you doubt? Why do you doubt doing something that the God that the Lord told you to do, if you peel back all the layers and get back to the root of it, it's because of a spirit of fear. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The spirit of fear. And what I've learned is do not let the spirit of fear just overtake your life because the spirit of fear will do what? Paralyze you. And it keeps you from doing anything. And I'm talking to doers this morning. It's like, it's, it's, it's like the lion that sees his prey. The lion oftentimes can't even catch much of his prey. But when he roars, the, 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 with that roar, it creates a spirit of fear and the, and the prey is paralyzed. He just can't even move because of fear and the lion hops on his prey, not because he was fast enough, but because he scared him. He put so much fear in him that he paralyzed them from being able to do anything and that's why the Bible says that the enemy Satan he roams around like a roaring lion trying to seek whom he can devour in other words if he has to seek out who he can devour that means he can't just devour anybody but the people that he can put fear in Have you ever had so much fear in you that you started playing out a situation that wasn't even real? Everybody say doubt. I wonder where they at. I wonder if they, I wonder where they at. Where, you know, it's three o'clock. They ain't home yet. I wonder where they at. And you start playing out all this stuff in your head. I'm telling you how the enemy will work. I'm telling you how the enemy will work. I remember one time, this wasn't long ago. This might have been like a year, two years ago or something. I was out of town for a long time. I was calling home and I couldn't reach her. And the devil started trying to plant doubt in my head. I couldn't reach her. I was like, where's she at? Where's this girl at? <laughs> Can pastor be transparent? Can I be real? I have a wonderful marriage. Love my wife. Faithful and all. I'm just telling you how the enemy works and how you have to deal with certain things. He plants in your head. 
It's 12 o'clock at night. I'm calling her. I'm out of town. I ain't got, I ain't heard of Pete. What, what? Fear. So, so in, I, I, in disguise, I called my son, Devin. I said, man, I don't know what's going on with your mom. Can you go to the house? <laughs> Devin got up at 1230 at night and went over to the house and called and said, mom was knocked out sleep and what on and so forth. And I don't know if I talked to her that night or the next morning. And I just, but see, that was the enemy trying to plot some kind of doubt, some kind of fear. In your, you understand what I'm saying? And you got to learn not to run with it. Because it'll have you playing out scenarios and situations that aren't even real in your life. And what the enemy wants you to do is to act on that fear. Does this make sense? So, so, so you started out doing good, and the enemy always wants to bring a storm. He always wants to bring a problem. He always wants to bring a situation, because all he's trying to do is derail you, to stop you from being a doer and becoming a doubter. Somebody say amen. amen. Isn't that good? So you have to, what did I say, distance yourself from doubters. Amen? Look with me. Um, let me give you my, how many points did I give you so far? Two? Go over to Mark chapter 11. Mark chapter 11. Uh, great verse of scripture here. And Jesus, verse 22, answering said unto them, have faith in God. Everybody say, have faith in God. He said, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not what? Doubt. Whereat? In his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Yeah, before I break this down, let me just share something with you real quick. Jesus here is talking about the power of words. It's talking about the power of speaking faith-filled words. He says, you should not doubt in your heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Listen to pastor real quick. Jesus said, you should have whatsoever you say of. The problem with so many Christians is we keep saying what we have. Instead, he said you can have what you say. Are you hearing me? Like, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, in, in denial. I'm not in denial of certain realities. The reality is... Uh, I woke up this morning and allergies hit me like a ton of bricks. I mean a ton of bricks, like head pounding, like migraine you wouldn't believe. And I, and I left the house and didn't take any allergy medicine. And me and Jeremiah was on the way to church and I thought, wow, why did I not take my allergy medicine? But I remember I packed some in my bag and I searched my bag and I found a pill and I was like, wow, thank you, Lord. And I took that pill, and it's starting to knock some of the edge off. But here's what I know. I don't walk around confessing my allergies because they're not mine. They're the devils who are trying to give them to me, and I have to learn not to accept what the enemy is trying to give. Amen. So it's not my allergy. It's not my cancer is not my diabetes, it's not my high blood pressure. You keep saying what you have. He said, stop doing that and you can have what you say. So what you need to start saying is what you don't have. You need to start saying what's the desire of your heart. I am healed, I am set free, I am delivered. That's what the Bible means when it says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He's teaching you to use the power of your words. Amen. I stopped years ago saying I'm sick. I don't say I'm sick. 
I'll say I don't feel good because I don't. That's the truth. But I don't say I'm sick. I don't say I'm sick as a dog. I don't say I'm sick as a cow. I don't say I'm sick as a horse. I don't say my feet are killing me. I don't speak death. I try to train my tongue to speak life based on what Jesus said right here in Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Have faith in God. And then he starts spelling out what having faith in God looks like. You can speak to mountains. And if you don't doubt in your heart, you can have whatsoever you saith. I wish I had time to teach it because the Bible says that a tongue is, 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 is a tree of life. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life. So think about this. When Adam was created, do you know how long Adam lived? Does anybody, any Bible scholars in here know how long Adam lived? Huh? I mean, he like Methuselah. Y'all heard Methuselah? Only thing y'all know is Methuselah just means old, right? Like Methuselah didn't do nothing in the Bible, just grew old. Like he did no exploits. He did nothing. He just got old, and he's known for being old. Well, men back then lived a long time, and I believe, if I'm correct, Adam lived to be a 930 years of age. You know why? You know why men so long live so long? Because when God created us, he created us with life. God created us. Y'all ever seen that movie, A Green Mile? Y'all yeah. remember how, you know, it was almost like his curse. It was like the bittersweet because he got a piece of life and he went on to outlive everybody. And that's how it is when God created you. He created you with a piece of who he is, spirit. Spirits never die. Your spirit, you, you never die. So when whatever, when you leave this earth, when people say you're dead, no, not the real you ain't dead. Your body ashes to ashes, dust. It goes back to where it came from, but your spirit didn't come from the dust. Your spirit came from God. And so as long as you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you're going you to live forever. You just determine where you're going to live at. Does this make sense? So, so because of all that life in them, it took the devil a long time to teach me and how to die. Like, men didn't even know how to die. Come on now. It, it wasn't a part of the, of the life system that God created. Come on, so even though he said, what did he tell Adam? You eat of this, you're going to surely die. Did he die the day he ate it? No, because there's so much life was in him. And now, because he allowed sin to introduce into the earth, then he had to teach him how to die. And the way he taught him how to die was through how they was talking. How they was talking. And that's why if you look at the book of Proverbs, it said a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Let me teach you real quick. Because remember in the garden after they sinned, he said, listen, you can have, the, you can have the, tree, the tree of life. You can have all these other trees. He said, there's one tree I don't want you to mess with. They mess with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They ate from it. Guess what? God didn't let them go back over to the tree of life. He put a flaming sword. Come on, read your Bible. And he kept them. The Bible said he kept them from getting over to the tree of life. They couldn't get there. You understand? But now he said today, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. So you can still tap into that tree of life. The Bible says, the Bible says, oh, there's a scripture slipping my mind. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm trying to teach you in just a few moments here something that took me years to learn, but I'm trying to tell you that you have to watch your mouth. Amen. Watch your mouth. I love you to death. I don't never tell my family I love you to death. Why? Why not love you to life? But we're so quick in this downward negative, this, 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 this law of gravity centered world where everything's being pulled downward. You got to fight to be positive in this world. Don't you? You ever ask somebody for directions and they say, you know what, you want to go down to the red stop sign, you're going to turn the corner, there's going to be a red light, you're going to get that, and then third, you're going to be a red light. Why is the light green just as much as it is red? 
But negative people, all they can remember is, I was trying to get to work and that light was red. And, but see, you ain't never, have you ever gone to work or gone somewhere and you got a green light? You said, Lord, I bless you for every green light I got on the way. You ever done that? No, you don't do that. You know what you do? You complain. I get stopped by every red light, that red light, because we are just prone to complain and be negative. And we keep saying what we have when he said, no, you can have what you say. And listen what he says. Listen, I love this. But shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass. He should have whatsoever he saith. And he starts out by saying, you should not doubt in his heart. You should not doubt in his heart. Now, you, my third point real quick, and I'm going to close on this. Write this down. Don't let the doubt in your head stop you from doing what's in your heart. Yeah, don't let the doubt in your head stop you from doing what's in your heart. Isn't that good? It didn't say don't doubt in your head. He said don't doubt in your heart. Because here's what I've learned. There are times you may doubt in your head. Just don't let that doubt get in your heart. And when I say your heart, I'm not talking about that little fleshly thing that pumps blood. I'm talking about the core of who you are, the heart of a tree, the core of a tree, the spirit of a man. That's your heart. You following what I'm saying? So, so you can't let that get in, into who you are. Can I share something with you? See, the Bible says uh, God has not given us, he's talking to believers, the spirit of fear. Remember I talked about how the enemy uses fear? When you get saved, God didn't give you the spirit of fear. Right. So understand something. As a believer, fear is not on the inside of you. Before you got saved, fear was a part of your human nature. But now that you're a Christian and that you say, fear is not a part of the, your new brand new spirit. So the enemy has to bring fear in from the outside and get you to take it, get you to buy into it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because God has not given you the spirit of fear. All right? Y'all got it? So he didn't say, don't doubt in your head. He knows there's going to be times you're going to doubt up here. But he said, just don't let that doubt get in your heart. It's like, remember Jesus made the statement, he said, listen, let not your heart be troubled. In other words, what he knows is you may have trouble on your job. He knows you may have trouble with your kids. He knows you may have trouble in your marriage, but just don't let that trouble get in your heart. Guard your heart, for out of your heart flows the issues of life. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? In other words, in other words, he didn't say, don't, don't, don't doubt in your head. He said, just don't let the doubt in your head stop you from doing what's in your heart. Can I, can I just teach for a moment? Because some of you, I can see, I can look at you, you're a little befuddled, you're a little confused on what I'm talking about. Because you don't really understand the difference between doubt in your head and doubt in your heart. Am I right? Yeah, be honest. be honest. That's how you learn. I tell my son in school, dude, don't be afraid to raise your hand because 20 other students are thinking the same thing and everybody's scared to ask the question. Ask the question because when you ask the question and get the answer, you no longer the dummy. Hit your name and say, we got to get out of the dumb, dumb flow. We got to get out of the dumb, dumb flow. Come on. And I'm being a little funny, I'm being a little facetious, but here's the deal. He said, my people are destroyed in Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, for a lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for a lack of dancing. My people are destroyed for a lack of having good church. My people are destroyed for a lack of, you know, being wild in service, having a good Holy Ghost time. We got that all over the church. But what we don't have is knowledge. And this is why I love coming to this church and being able to talk to people who are disciplined enough to sit there and listen to their pastor. And I don't have to hoop and I don't have to holler and I don't have to entertain and I don't have to perform because you say give me knowledge.
Because you can't be destroyed if you got knowledge. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so, don't let the doubt in your head stop you from doing what's in your heart. Let me give a couple of examples and I'm going to be done. Uh, th there have been people who've come to me from time to time. Um, I, I wish I had time to really dive into it. But when I say doubt in your head, what I mean is this. In other words, God will give you something in your heart and you know it by revelation. It, it's, in other words, it's been revealed to you. It, some things, you know, just aren't explainable. Some things just have to be experienced through the Spirit of God. This is why I don't sit around arguing, debating with people, with atheists and, and, and Muslims and all kind of other faiths and religions and people who want to debate with me about how Jesus is not the true and living God. I don't have time for that. Because what I know is basically that spiritual things are foolishness to people who can't discern by the spirit. So why would I be sitting up here trying to debate something to you that you can't understand anyway unless you believe and just trust God and allow the spirit of God to live in you? The Bible says it's the Holy Spirit that draws us to the Father anyhow. So I'm not getting ready to sit up there and be arguing with you. The only time I'm going to have a debate with you if you got a sincerity to know what truth is. But if you want to debate with me to prove me wrong, I ain't got time for it. You know what I do? I stand back like Elijah, and I tell him, you call on your God, and I'm going to call on my God, and we're going to see which God answers by fire. Come on, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Somebody say amen. amen. So, 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 so to, 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 to do what's in your heart is through revelation. When I say he knows you're going to doubt in your head, it, it, you ever heard the term in the court, cast reasonable doubt? See, that's all the enemy wants to do. It's, it's, it's cause you to operate through reason. He, he wants you to, that's not reasonable. That, that's not logical. That's not sensible. But you can't really live. That's why I opened up and said, how many of you want to live the successful Christian life? You can't always do that by doing things that are sensible. Sometimes you're going to do things that don't make sense because you know what? It don't make sense to the head. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's, 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 not, it's not reasonable to the head, but it's revelation in the heart. Does this make sense? So I've had people come to me and like they were in bad shape, bad turmoil, financial turmoil. They come to me and they said, Pastor, you know, and this has been over the years, numbers of people. They go to like different places like debt consolidation companies. And the debt consolidation company will look at all their income and all their outgo. And they say, okay, we're going to help you get out of debt, but show us what all your outgo is. And then the people in the church say, well, we got 10% going to the church. And they say, oh, 10% going to the church. That's not reasonable in your condition. That's not sensible in your condition. That's not logical in your condition. And if you don't distance yourself from the doubters, they'll have you believe in how they believe. And they'll cast reasonable doubt in your head when you know what God told you to do in your heart. Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all saying amen. And, and I've seen it where people walk out of there and say, I am not about to take that advice because I know I got a revelation in my heart that God has called me to be a tither, 10% of whatever God has given me, and they've watched God do what he said he's going to do when you do what you're supposed to do. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Shout, I'm a doer. Listen, when we started this church, the devil tried to cast reasonable doubt in my head. In other words, I mean, we didn't have no money. We didn't have no members. I didn't have any ministerial degree. We didn't have any sort of resources from anywhere. It was not reasonable for me to start a church. It was not sensible for me to start a church. It was not logical for me to start a church. But I didn't let the doubt in my head stop me from doing what was in my heart. Lord, this is what Jesus is saying. If you don't doubt in your heart, if you know you got a word from God in your heart, it doesn't matter what the enemy throws at your head. Just guard your heart. And are y'all hearing what your pastor this morning? Come on. And he said, you shall have whatsoever you saith. Praise God. 
And I used to, talking about the power of the tongue, I would stand up, and I would stand up in front of three folks that we were pastoring at the time, and I would say, you know what, this room is filled, praise God, to capacity. And I say, and I'm speaking into the television cameras, and we didn't have a television camera at the time. And I'm, are you hearing what I'm saying? This room is full, next service is full, TV camera on the website. This is when we had three people. It was not sensible, it was not logical, it was not, are you hearing me? But it didn't stop me from doing what was in my heart. I remember Pastor Trace and I wouldn't even be sitting here today if that was the logic that I ran off of. Because I remember when, we, when I first met her and I first saw her, I was on the playground playing basketball. And, and I was playing, I, and she walked by, and I said, ooh. I, 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 I like, ooh, what should I, look, what should I do? And I'm looking over, and I said, man. And she was with a mutual friend. And, and so I went over, and I may had a few words with her and, and the mutual friend. And, 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 and they said they were going over to the Dairy Queen. And so I was like, I had all this doubt. I was like, I wanted to say something to her, but I had all this doubt in my head. I, don't, I didn't know if I should ask for a number. I had all this doubt. I just, I just didn't know. You know what I'm saying? You know how you are sometimes? The spirit of fear tried to come up on me because this girl is long and she's tall and she, she's brown and she's chocolate and her hair is I was like, oh, I love it. But I just didn't know because I just had this doubt. Too. I didn't want to get turned down. I didn't want to get, I didn't want to get abused. I didn't want, I didn't, I had all this doubt, but then they had left. But I knew something was in my heart. So I said, oh, even though I got some doubt in my head, let me jump on my 10 speed. I jumped on my 10 speed. You remember your huffy 10 speed? Jumped on my 10 speed and I rolled over to the Dairy Queen and they was there getting some cones and I went up to her and I said, hey girl. I'm an Aries. I was like, floats. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But what if I would have been controlled by the doubt that was in my head? Come on. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sometimes you just got to excuse the doubt in your head and just do what's in your heart. This is why I love people who God put around me who have an armor bearer spirit who say, Pastor, do all that is in your heart. Heart, I am with you according to your heart. In other words, I may do things that don't make sense to your head, but you are not boxing me up based on what's in your head. You understand this principle about a revelation that's flowing through a man's heart. And when you get behind that, ain't no telling what God might do in your midst. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Somebody shout hallelujah in this church. Shout I'm a doer and not a doubter. Because you got to learn how to cast doubt out if you're going to be a doer. Come on, stand to your feet. In other words, in other words, for the life of me, here's what I don't understand. When I got saved, <laughs> I was so happy about being saved. I didn't say I didn't struggle at first, because I did. I had to change all my friends, had to do, I mean, it was this process, but I was happy. I ne never forget how happy I was. And uh, I was in a little chapel in Terre Haute, Indiana. I was sentenced to three years. I got saved at my mother-in-law's church on Sunday. And they drove me to Terre Haute, Indiana on Monday. So I spent my first three years of being saved, incarcerated. And I'll never forget, oh, I just was so happy about being saved. I had saved because I had a need from the Lord. People don't get saved because everything going good. Ain't never one of you got saved because everything was going good. I got saved because I had a need, so I feel like, man, if I can't, I mean, I know where I'm going to be at, I know where I'm going. 
I ain't no women in there. <laughs> ain't no alcohol in there. Ain't no drugs in there. Ain't no all this in there. So if I can't be saved in there, I remember being so happy. And I remember a guy came to me and asked me, did I have the Holy Spirit? I said, I don't, I don't really know what you mean. I didn't. He said, do you have the Holy Spirit? He said, do you speak in a heavenly language? I said, I, I was like those believers in the book of Acts. I said, I, I, I didn't even know there'd be a Holy Spirit. He opened the scriptures up to me, and I began to read the scriptures. I said, I want that. And we sat in a little chapel in Terre Haute, Indiana, and he laid hands on me. And I received the Holy Spirit. And like that, man, my belly, I started flowing like rivers of living water. It was almost like a faucet I couldn't turn off. I, it, they, they, had, they had certain times where, you know, you had to be in your bunk for count. It's called count. You had to be there for count. You weren't there for count. You're going to be in trouble. And so I knew count was coming, but I'm speaking in the Holy Spirit, and I'm having, I just couldn't turn it off, and I'm laughing. I got so much joy. I just knew, man, God has done something significant in my life. Few weeks later, we're in some setting, teaching, and Bible study. Brother started opening the scriptures talking about being a tither. Well, I'm new to this. I'm a tither? What's that? Show me in the scripture. Well, I was working a job at Terry Hunt, Indiana. I think I was making $32 a month. Basically used, used my commissary. Out of that $32 a month, I start sending 10% of it back home to my church because they showed me in the scripture, this is what you're supposed to do as a Christian. Are you hearing what I'm saying? They, they, they said, not weeks after, I learned another principle. They said, you're supposed to serve and help with the work of the Lord. So right in that little chapel, I was served. They'd have services. I would serve. I'd pass out the tissues like they do. I'd do all, I would serve. That's what it said to do. I'm sharing this with you because I don't understand for the life of me how you can be in church as a Christian and your pastor says, serve, it's biblical, and you don't do it. Your pastor says, tithe, it's biblical, and you won't do it. Your pastor says, what? Showed you something. You want the Holy Ghost? Why? Why are you? I'm scared of the Holy Ghost. Why are you scared of what God got there? God, God ain't gonna hurt you. Anything God gives you is gonna make your life better. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know this is challenging, but I want to raise up doers. Let me say this one more time and I'm gonna be done. Not Ditters. Not ditters. I did that. I used to do that. I serve not ditters, doers.